afternoon. Um, I, I should say that this um, paper is a part of a, um, a larger study that I'm trying to do on Mara Santos Febres um, and, and, and trying to think through a lot of her writing um, because she writes pretty much in all of the genres and um, um, although she centers her work on Puerto Rico, um, I'm trying to read it as a, a map for understanding um, much of the um, Caribbean. So, uh, there are no sharks in the sky, Caribbean identity and black positionality in Cualquier Miércoles Soy Tuya by Mayra Santos Perez. And I'm gonna talk then, really um, give some brief um, introductory remarks, um, talk a bit, um, uh, moving away from what I, I normally talk about, um, women um, writers and, and how they write about um, concerns for women. I'm going to look at the three male characters in this, I just thought it would be quite an interesting um, moving away from. Talk about the three male characters in this particular novel who are Tadeo, Julian, and um, Chino, and then hopefully end with some concluding remarks. Um, so, Maya Santos Pérez is also an essayist. She writes um, in one particular text, which is called Sobre Piel y Papel, um, and in an essay that's um, titled In Cold Blood. She says, at first glance, it seems totally inconceivable that on an illegal island such as this one, so subject to criminality, kidnappings, thefts, at ATM machines and residences in gated communities. On an island, I repeat, where babies are stolen from hospitals, entire families are scattered, and that devours the bloody news of the tabloid press throughout the rest of the day, I emphasize and stop to take a breath. On an island such as this, it's surprising that her writers do not start writing like crazy about the perfect crime. And see, even there with that, um, um, a, introduction with those words, uh, she could well be describing so much of the rest of the Caribbean, um, Trinidad certainly. Um, and so just the cover of the book there, and I'll begin. So in the text, Consuming the Caribbean, Mimi Shala claims that the Caribbean is constantly caught up in a politics of the picturesque. Shala arguably, arguably illuminates the various ways in which the Caribbean has been consumed its produce, its landscapes, and its black bodies. In a review of Shella's book, Philip Nanton further points out that there are underlying issues and distinctions to be made around consumption. And by way of an example, he indicates that there are subtle undertones which highlight the contradictions of consumption. In this, I suspect that the Puerto Rican writer, Mayra Santos Pérez, would agree with Nanton. In her novel, Cualquier Miércoles Soy Tuya, which is from, uh, published in 2000, Santos Febres presents a stereotyped image of the Caribbean island nation of Puerto Rico, a detective novel in which there are drug dealers, sex, drug lords, illegal immigrants, sex, desire, and more sex. But then there's also religion, poverty, violence, gangs, crime, politicians, and corruption. All of this is the reality of the Caribbean in the 21st century. At the same time, through her graphic haunting descriptions, Santos Febres also presents a Puerto Rico that is seen as the promised land by the black character of Tadeo Chandelot. In the context of familiar narratives about the endangered male, Santos Febres takes the bold move of centering the narrative in cualquier miércoles around Tadeo, who is a black Dominican illegally living in Puerto Rico. There are so many markers to his role which can contribute to our understanding of the complexity of erasure and invisibility in hegemonic spaces, as well as their multivalent oppression. We mostly see Tadeo through the eyes of another character, the white male reporter and fledgling writer Julian. Their engagement is nuanced and becomes quite in-depth in a short period of time. In the novel, which is set in San Juan, Santos Febres describes an urban world of suffering, dreams, loneliness, and eroticism. 
In it, she also makes apparent the way in which consumption can both marginalize and at the same time include. So in this paper, what I seek to do is present an in-depth analysis of race and black positionality in the novel, in which I argue that Cualquier Miércoles is in fact a commentary on popular Puerto Rican, uh, and we can read that as Caribbean, culture and society, and that with it, what Santos Ferre seeks to do is point out that subtle forms of discrimination continue to exist and must be understood if Puerto Rican society is to move forward. I use the phrase black positionality to frame this essay and to underscore that identity influences not just our understanding of ourselves, which is always uh, relationally shaped, and our understanding of the world in which we live, but perhaps more importantly, it also marks our outlook on that world given the hierarchies of power in which we are forced to operate. In the book Imagine Communities, Benedict Anderson argues that ethnic or communal identities are imagined because the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members, meet them, or even hear of them. Yet in the, mind, in the minds of each lives the image of their communion. A clear sense of affiliation is described in the novel, but more importantly, non-Puerto Ricanness is signaled um, quite subtly uh, through race. Santos Febres herself, as a middle-class uh, Afro-Puerto Rican, can contribute to our understandings of race and identity uh, in contemporary Puerto Rico. Moreover, in today's global village, the issue of immigration and migrant labor are central to Caribbean life, as neighboring island nations that are seen as better off financially are forced to continuously receive migrants who, in fleeing extreme poverty, or um, political, um, negative political situations are normally prepared to do anything in order to survive. When Julian comes to understand the physical and psychological trauma of some Puerto Ricans as well as the migrant community and this impact on society, when through his connection to the underworld drug culture and the moral turpitude on the island, he begins to understand the negotiation of space, then he is transformed. To what extent home is then recreated in his mind is also what this uh, essay seeks to um, assess. Philosophically, we can argue that the theme of the novel is the writer's role and his art uh, in the society to which he belongs. Um, much of the time in the novel, Julian, the character, describes what he thinks a writer should be. But I argue that it's only when Julian, the character, meets, loves, and comes to understand his fellow Puerto Ricans and other people in Puerto Rican society, that he actually becomes transformed into Julian, the writer, no longer the daydreamer existing unconsciously in the country, but a man who understands his own marginalized status in a post-colonial society. Through a, comp a comparative analysis of Julian, Tadeo, and the drug lord Chino Pereira, we can piece together the murder mystery in the novel but we also come to a partial understanding of Puerto Rican national consciousness, and perhaps by extension, that of Caribbean identity formation, as well as the politics of island life, as Julian is placed in a larger context than that of his everyday anonymous life in the city. So the novel, I think, is quite structurally um, innovative in that it exists on two levels, presenting two stories as one. The novel takes place on two planes, describing both the, un the urban underworld of Puerto Rico and the middle class world with norms and values almost perpendicular to the urban underworld, but with telling intersections. And they combine shockingly, as Santos Ferris points out, that the two worlds are as easily bridged in the same way as most Puerto Ricans journey between the island of Puerto Rico and the US mainland. The plot of the novel is quite intricate. Julian Castrolat is a proofreader at La Noticia newspaper, and he dreams of uh, being a writer, but he remains unsuccessful. When Julian's routine existence in the newsroom uh, comes to an end, he's actually laid off um, from his job due to cutbacks and the downturn in the economy. He has a, ch a chance meeting with Tadeo Chandelou at a cafe one night. Despite the unlikeliness of the situation, that is, the cultural, class, and racial differences between them, Julian and Tadeo's chance meeting makes for a friendship, and it is Tadeo who then gets Julian a job as a night, 
receptionist working the graveyard shift together with him at the Motel Tulan, which is um, a kind of curious, um, shady um, a, a motel and um, where most patrons pay um, an hourly rate. So that should give you an idea of the type of place. Um, once Julian begins to work at the motel, he keeps a journal of all of the activities he witnesses which seem to run the gamut of San Juan society, especially that of the repeat customers. Uh, in it, he writes uh, all of his thoughts. It is Julian who is the narrator of the story, and the novel weaves back and forth between Julian the narrator and Julian the character. Uh, this is a world of illegal immigrants, Dominican and Haitian, and the racism that they experience. It's also one in which drug trafficking and corruption appear to be the norm. Through the friendship, the two men's uh, individual circumstances and vast differences are highlighted. Julian is, uh, as I mentioned, he's a white, middle-class Puerto Rican, while Tadeo is um, more intricate. He's a poor, black, Dominican of Haitian parentage, illegally resident in Puerto Rico. So the men meet and talk over subs at a diner one night, and this is the description that um, she gives us, um, the narrator gives us. Um, hey bro, sit over here so we don't end up eating all by our lonesome. That way we won't look like husbands kicked out of their houses. He chewed with his whole mouth, like he was trying to swallow an elephant. No manners whatsoever, I noticed, thinking what my mother, who worked so hard to teach her only child, the rudiments of etiquette would say if she saw me at the table with a slob like that. Tadeo's mother obviously didn't lose any sleep over such things. Maybe her biggest worry was just being able to feed him at all. And that's how Tadeo attacked his food. Um, as if at any second, his share might disappear from his plate. So with these lines, uh, Santos Febres reduces the two men. They're presented as simply two anonymous souls whose paths cross one night at a cafe and um, following the sort of pressures of the day. Julian's comment about what his mother would have thought about Tadeo serves to heighten the invalidity of the notion of the nuclear family as a unit, which provides social support to persons from a particular class in Puerto Rican society. First, because Julian's mother would never have sanctioned such a friendship, the suggestion being that to her, even their crossing paths would be a peculiar notion but also because we soon come to learn that Julian is, his, is himself estranged from his family. In addition, the statement is also a comment on the irrational fears that some people in the society, such as Julian's mother, have towards blacks and particularly foreigners. So um, I've, I've just titled each of the sections um, um, with, I think, a phrase that I think describes what we come to learn of them. So Tadeo Chandelo, um, all of we is one family, meaning we, uh, we all come from the same human family. So Tadeo, uh, or through the characters of Julian and Tadeo, Santos Ferris calls out the insidious racism in the country, the existence of white and middle class privilege and she tells of the criminal underworld in Puerto Rico which supports the drug culture and ironically abuses its own loyal workers in that they are often used as drug mules and serve to dispense the drugs but live dispensable lives. As once caught by law enforcement, they are easily replaced by other eager youth. Race is underscored in the novel through the very invisibility that Tadeo ironically seeks to perform. Tadeo um, tells Julian, no man, the trick is in making yourself disappear from the wide view, as if you were not the one there. It's a comment which echoes the lives of many immigrants, illegal or other. In keeping to themselves and quietly going about their days, many hope to not be seen, that is, to not call attention to themselves. But it is clear that while this <laughs> attempt at invisibility helps Tadeo with the job at the motel, his blackness is never erased. And in fact, it underscores his very being. Consistently in the novel, Santos Ferris calls attention to the fact that Tadeo's blackness equates with foreignness in the Puerto Rican context. During one of the three times that he illegally enters Puerto Rico, Tadeo is involved in an incident, and he describes it as um, a boberia, a nothingness, 
Um, every day he would go, they would go to a bar after work to grab a beer. And the normal everyday habit of going to the bar to have a drink and unwind after a day's work for Tadeo signals trouble. He's in the bar when a fight breaks out and shots are fired. Once the police are called, Tadeo is picked up and taken in by the police, although he is simply uh, a patron at the bar. It was when they asked for my papers and I didn't know what to say. No, I kept quiet. The next day, I woke up in the belly of an airplane. And um, given his illegal status, as soon as he's picked up by the police, he is, of course, deported. Santos Ferreira skillfully illustrates the interplay between invisibility and visibility through Tadeo. Although she acknowledges that his illegality is a part of the problem, she signals that his always present blackness continuously makes him the target of checks or surveillance by the police, and that is why he constantly tries to live an invisible life. Uh, Santa Severis constructs around the characters of Tadeo and Julian a picture of real daily life in the city. In the urban space of San Juan by night and also by day, she outlines the melancholy, the inequity, the sheer sense of aloneness that pervades the lives of the inhabitants. They say cities are full of nameless crowds, but in these islands, adrift in the middle of the Caribbean, only a few loners cruise the cities at night, and they recognize each other. Once the sun goes down, the swarm of suits and workers running from office to office, from stores to delis to schools, retreats back to the suburban underworld in the shifting outskirts of the country, the swamps and the beaches. The city is like a huge park in a small town, ready to welcome the night's marauders. Security guards, cops on the vampire beat, wars, addicts, transvestites, taxi drivers, hotel and restaurant workers, dope dealers, and reporters. In this description, the gated communities of the suburbs are presented as, as places of refuge and retreat, and the city has become a sprawling space of an apocalyptic-like mass of people. It is when Tadeo moves to the city that his life changes. In the city, he goes from being drug user to peddler and eventually to drug mule. The idea of community does not arise because in the city it's all about an anonymity. The individual becomes so isolated that what is immediately evoked is a sense of a lack of caring permeating the cityscape. This solitary description, which is presented in the first chapter, foreshadows much of what is to come in the novel. The people who we, uh, who we later meet at the Motel Tulan are all lost and lonely. Through the character of Tadeo Chandelou, Santos Perez describes the physical experiences of poverty and suffering on the island. In one of their first encounters, Julian describes seeing himself reflected in Tadeo's eyes, just one other unemployed um, guy. And this vision shocks him, first because it is a reversal of roles, um, white through the eyes of the black seeing subject, but also because for the first time, Julian sees clearly his own vulnerability. Perhaps the most interesting thing which Julian learns from Tadeo is how to dress to blend in and not be noticed while using what Tadeo calls his peripheral vision to see and to note everything that's going on around him. As a black person in Puerto Rican society, Tadeo is accustomed to living a shadowed existence, unseen and unworthy of a voice. He has experienced the desperate contours of urban loneliness and understands that there is a mystery in everyday life, but that you have to really see the people around you. And um, as he says, um, for you Puerto Ricans, this is hard to understand because you've lost the memory of servitude. What Tadeo has learned, or maybe what he's always known because of his uprootedness and his blackness, is that subtle undertones of class and race demarcate difference amongst, uh, among Puerto Ricans and as a black foreigner, he had to find a way by which to observe the people and to learn from them. In this way, he makes his invisibility in the society work for him. Identity gives individuals a set of rules or norms by which to act, dress, speak, 
be and behave in a community. Ultimately, Taleo recognizes that his identity is dependent on his historical background and his life experiences. This is why he is so easily able to manipulate the way in which he is seen and thus repeatedly negotiate Puerto Rican life. As a Dominican of Haitian extraction, he knows that he is different because he's already had to confront that aspect of his identity as a black person in the Dominican Republic. And here we can agree with Guillermo Irisani, uh, who argues that the novel deploys geography as a vehicle to plot culture and identity. The narrative eye focuses upon marginal spaces and upon the roots employed to link up these settings to each other and to locations of hegemonic power. The Motel Tulan stands for interconnectivity between subaltern and hegemonic spaces and simultaneously becomes a metaphor for the radically heterogeneous social space. The narrator historicizes subaltern locations and uncovers the biographies of the subjects inhabiting them. All the while, the novel attempts to bring into the nation's memory the stories occupying these marginal geographies, consistently excluded from hegemonic discourse. Um, so Julian con consistently reflects on Taleo's displacement, his marginalization as a Dominican in Puerto Rico, and the complex web of oppressions which have marked his life today. Tadeo's first trip to Puerto Rico was a legal one because he had found a job as a farmhand on a coffee plantation. Lured by the attraction of the big city, he soon quit that job for several odd jobs. This was when he hatched a plan to pay for a Puerto Rican wife and thus obtain legal status. The plan almost worked, but before he could save all of the money necessary, he was detained by immigration and deported. The $600 which he had on him, the sum of his savings to that time, disappears, supposedly to fund his deportation back to the Dominican Republic. Back at home, Tadeo knows that he's immobilized by poverty, so he chooses to escape to Puerto Rico again, where, barring the confining racist paradigms, jobs are plentiful. Puerto Rico represents possibility and opportunity for Tadeo as much as economic transformation. So with one failed crossing under his belt, the second attempt to reach Puerto Rico on a boat does meet with success, and from there he goes to live in Paralelo 37, which is a, a, a barrio, a poor, drug-infested, um, in San Juan. Tadeo knows that you cannot watch the world from the sidelines as the only result is a sort of self-marginalization. In this sense, the ways in which Tadeo enacts his identity as a poor black Dominican slash Haitian is constantly shifting. So for example, when he meets Doña Candida, who is a neighbor in the barrio, he performs religiosity as a survival mechanism and creates as well as deploys a new or rather a different identity. And he tells Julian, Doña Candida looked after me like a stray dog, took me to her church. They say opportunity slips away fast, so right away I offered to clean the place for a few pesos. One day I stayed for the service. I don't know if it was the exhaustion or the stress I was living under or bad memories from surviving those long nights on the high seas, but halfway through the mass, I started shouting that I too was a sinner, a real sinner, and that a divine angel told me to give myself to the Lord. I heard myself shouting in tongues. Inside I was saying to myself, Tadeo, what's this nonsense? But I couldn't explain it. No, senor. I went to the Pentecostal church for a few months. Then I got over it. It was a brother from the church who got me this job at Motel Tulan. Since they gave me the night shift, I stopped going to worship. Thank heaven. Those people wailing really got on my nerves. So throughout the novel, what we see is that Tadeo gives Julian a clear sense not only of the pervasiveness of racial prejudice in Puerto Rican society, but also the constant negotiation which must take place in the Caribbean, whether in private life or on the work front. In this slide, it is important to note that despite his performance at the Pentecostal church, Tadeo is a believer, um, but in his own way. So early, early on, he has conversations with Julian, and he talks to him um, about um, not committing sins um, and not um, um, talking down to your mother because that's a sin. And so Tadeo sees resent, redemption as a self substance uh, hold on. Tadeo sees redemption as a self-substantiating act, but not as something handed down 
from a benevolent God. So overall, we can argue that Thaleo's racial positioning is embedded in trauma, loss, and poverty. It is almost as if Thaleo completely understands that his black body, marked by the trauma of poverty, but also of history, is a site of resistance. He never underscores his status as a partial citizen in the Dominican Republic, nor as an illegal immigrant in Puerto Rico. What he constantly points out is that his existence in the city is as one of many. It is, in one sense, ironic that Tadeo never questions his sense of belonging or non-belonging in Puerto Rican society as a black Caribbean man. But this may be best understood because he is more caught up in the daily necessity of life. So he, um, he tells Julian, back in my country, back in my country, people live with very little. Some land around the house, chicken, salted herring, bags of wheat flour, and rice. And that's it. I'm not saying life is happy, but you live on very little. That's why when I left for Puerto Rico the first time, it was like a fog lifted from my eyes. I had already emigrated once as a child uh, with the whole family, from one side of the Rio Masacre to the other. But things don't change much either side of the border. I never thought being Haitian was different from being Dominican. So Tadeo's existence then as a child in a dually informed place makes him more accepting of the struggle to exist in San Juan. His claim that both sides of the border is the same is apt because he understands that what unites them is incessant, extreme, and cyclical poverty. He left Haiti, the land of his parents, as a child. For him, Haiti exists only as nostalgia, that is, a nostalgia for a home that has never existed. His mom, there's a lot that he recounts to Julian where his mother keeps telling him, you know, Tadeo, you're, you're Haitian, you have to remember that you're Haitian. Um, but in the Dominican Republic, the dominant discourse defines national identity as white. This is why Tadeo's mother repeatedly points out to him that when the money gets tight in Puerto Rico, the blacks will be blamed. In an absurd twist, Tadeo meets with the same type of racism in Puerto Rico, the land of perceived economic um, opportunity. Sorry, when the money gets tight in the Dominican Republic, the blacks will be blamed. So Tadeo does not um, deny racism in the Dominican Republic. In fact, when there, he's constantly aware of his race, but he points out that poverty is insidious in nature and that for him, uh, to help his family out of poverty is the most important goal. So the racism in Puerto Rico does not bother him as much as the poverty at home in the Dominican Republic does. He's prepared to risk everything in Puerto Rico to make a life and to earn money to alleviate the poverty of his mother, sister, and the rest of the family in Bani. Indeed, his family is his motivation for persistently going to Puerto Rico. Although he is aware of the illegality of his status, Tadeo realizes that he'll never be able to self-actualize in the Dominican Republic. And so the desperate measure of crossing the seas to gain entry to Puerto Rico is seen more as a sacrifice to attain the dream of bettering life in Bani for his uh, family. And we see throughout the novel that for Tadeo, family is everything. When Tadeo is given the lucrative offer then to bring a shipment of drugs from Miami, he sees it as an opportunity. Chino Pereira offers him $30,000 with an, an all-expenses-paid uh, trip to be a mule in the shipment of drugs. Uh, and for Tadeo, the moment is specifically a way out of poverty and more generally a way to help his mother and the rest of the family uh, as they kind of continue to eke out uh, an existence in Bani. So Julian spends a lot of time warning him about the risk involved in, um, in, in the trip. And Tadeo responds, if you don't cry, you'll not be fed. And nothing ventured, nothing gained. This can't be worse than crossing the ocean in a pirogue. At least there are no sharks in the sky. So it's this sort of accommodation that Tadeo reads, uh, it is in this sort of accommodation that Tadeo reads the possibility of being caught and jailed as simply one of a multiplicity of forces that have to date shaped his life. However, it is not the worst. In a chapter titled The 
disappearance of the saint, Julian learns that Tadeo participated in the group rape of a woman, which took place one night on one of the boat trips coming over to Puerto Rico. Tadeo looked on as the woman was being raped by four other men. And Tadeo says that he was aghast at the treatment of the woman and that initially he went over to help her, to save her from the brutality, but he ends up violating her himself by participating in the, in the gang rape. Rather than protecting her from sexual aggression and assault, Tadeo becomes complicit in promoting masculine silence and enacting yet another moment of patriarchal violence on the black female body. In that moment, Tadeo as heterosexual male holds the power and through the rape, he demonstrates that power to the other men who participate in the rape. It is nevertheless difficult for the reader to make sense of how a black, Haitian, Dominican, illegal immigrant who epitomizes historical suffering can choose to participate in such a brutal and violent act. This sexual act carried within it very contradictory notions given Tadeo's social concern for his family as well as his, at times, ethical and religious thoughts and actions. A more nuanced operation of power is later displayed when Tadeo enters into psychological conflict with his inner self. In Miami, when he's apprehended with the shipment of drugs and is jailed and is sitting in the, in the jail cell waiting to be deported, um, he sort of accepts his fate with a sense of um, resignation. And he feels that the, the, what has been meted out to him, the fate that's been meted out to him, by the judicial system, well, there has to be some kind of justice. Um, but essentially, he refuses to be a snitch uh, complicit in helping the police to take down Chino Pereira. Moreover, although physically he managed to distance himself from this shameful situation of the group rape in which he participated, he was never able to obliterate the sense of self-resentment for the inhumanity of his actions that night. And he recognizes his internalized machismo. Um, okay. um, Tadeo proclaims his intention, or constantly proclaims his intention, uh, to attempt to return illegally to Puerto Rico in the future, as long as the economic situation in the Dominican Republic remains unchanged then he recognizes that he would have no choice because Puerto Rico as a U.S. dependency holds transnational economic power by comparison with the Dominican Re Republic. And he pointedly remarks to, ta to Julian that he doesn't see that, there is, that it makes any sense to try to live in any other way. Um, through the character of Tadeo, Julian learns that real life is about chaos and chance and that ultimately we have no control over it. How are we doing for time? I forgot my I forgot my um, my watch. So it's just five to three. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So so um, <coughs> to say a little bit about Chino, um, it, it, he's one of the most violent characters in the um, in the novel because he's the drug lord. The same sense of chaos and chance reigns in Santos Ferris's char characterization of the criminal underworld in San Juan. Right. She presents the city as a fragile paradise where some people have and always obtain more, while others struggle constantly but never seem to obtain or retain. When Julian is chatting with Bimbi, um, and Bimbi is one of the young um, drug um, pushers. Um, one night at the motel, they discuss the influx of Dominicans to Puerto Rico. Bimbi feels that they are creating their own drug cartel in San Juan and, just, and thus taking away from Puerto Ricans. Julian astutely tells him, I think I lost my slide. So Julian um, astutely tells him that at the end of the day, the Dominicans are 
no different to anyone else in Puerto Rico who struggles to survive and avoid poverty. Um, but Bimbi's response is 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 he 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 doesn't really care. He he really just centers <laughs> on himself. So um, Santos Perez underscores the objectifying mode of perception of the other on the island. Bimbi's insular vision causes him to see only his own needs and wants, and although he knows and works with Tadeo, he does not see himself in the same way as he perceives the black illegal migrant. What he does not understand is Julian's relationship with Tadeo. He, finds, he reminds Julian that as an undocumented, Tadeo is dispensable to everyone, but more so to Chino and the drug dealing business. So like so many young persons at 17, Bimbi sees only the possibility for access to money and physical possessions in Chino's world. He quietly confesses envy for Tadeo as the one chosen by Chino for the Miami drug run because he feels that as a drug mule, money is guaranteed. And so he wants to go on a drug run because he is not at all faced by the threat of being locked up. It is ironic that in this sentiment, his ideals echo those of Tadeo in that he also feels that if you get caught, then you keep silent and you take your punishment. Um, but his sense of optimism dictates that there's always present the idea of taking the chance and not being caught. This is the type of linear thinking that Chino demands from his workers, together with a blind respect. Oh, so that's why I, I got lost with my slides. Um, Right, and so when uh, Bimbi is talking about Chino with Julian, he says, um, it's best to not cross him. You don't have to be real intelligent to know that. So it, it, he displays a, a kind of a fear for, um, uh, for Chino. In the novel, the criminal underworld is disconcertingly linked to the political world of the island thus ensuring the survival of criminality and criminal elements in the society, but ironically also ensuring the survival of the country. Santos Ferris suggests that in Puerto Rico, crime is endemic. It is a way to pay for the things in life that are needed and so it is accepted on the macro level. The eventual social decay of the place is, is not surprising. It is the perfect environment for nurturing crime and deviancy. The drug lords take over and the form formulations of identity which take place in such settings are by necessity compartmentalized. And so at the motel, Julian learns of the shady, shady dealings of Chino. Uh, oh wow, this is like, okay. And, um, and, and, the, and all of the young um, guys who work with him. Most importantly, Chino controls Paralelo 37 and is constantly in the process of obtaining more territory. It is by controlling turf across the city that the drug lords create their empires. So even though he was in jail at one point in time, Chino was uh, acquiring um, turf. We learned that warring gangs fight and die for territory. In fact, it is noteworthy that even when incarcerated, Chino was able to continue his business as well as secure its expansion. Crime in the society is one aspect which keeps the country afloat, and this is seen through Chino's elaborate business setup. Politicians and police alike are corrupt and receive payments from him. But also, there's an ease and flexibility to the way in which both Tadeo and Julian join in and become caught up in Chino's dealings. Moreover, violent crime is seen as problematic but accepted as an unfortunate effect of the drug culture. At the same time, other aspects, for example, drug dealing, then become accepted necessary negotiation. When Tadeo decides to go to Miami, he tells Julian that he's asked Bimbi to replace him on the job at, at Tulan. Uh, Julian reacts quite melodramatically, saying that Bimbi is a real criminal. But Tadeo reminds him that they too are on the tape and are involved in criminally delinquent activities, to which Julian responds, yeah, but we are decent criminals, like the majority of citizens of this country. So that um, in this humoristic twist, what Santos Ferris seems 
to be doing is highlighting the small, surreptitious, and almost mundane ways in which crime has become acceptable across the nation. Israel Reyes supports this notion when he argues when a subject uses irony to examine her or his subjectivity and looks on the self as if it were other, then that subject places irony at the service of humor and its ability to blur the lines between selfhood and otherness. In the same vein, when Julian talks to Bimbi about being caught up in the world of drug dealing, we recognize that Bimbi has bought into the creeping globalized capitalistic culture spread from North America. Julian tries to teach Bimbi the things that he has learned from Tadeo about invisibility and not calling attention to himself, but of course Bimbi um, simply ignores him. He, um, for example, he's, he's sporting a Rolex one day and he says, you know, when he wears things like that, he gets more um, ladies. Um, so Bimbi recognizes that his life of crime bears fruit. However, he both fears and idolizes Chino. For his part, after some time at the Motel Tulan, Julian is also um, asked to do jobs for Chino, and he knows that the jobs are drug-related, um, that is to say illegal, and uh, yet he does them. Julian then reflects on the ease with which he, like many Puerto Ricans, come to straddle both worlds. He observes the antics of the labor attorney Efrain Soreno meeting with union VIPs as they make a deal over the development and the control of Parallelo 37. He later understands that the spiraling violence and criminal activities in the society are related to the complete fragmentation of Puerto Rican society. So I do want to end. How are we doing for time? We're still Maybe moving. Ten, ten, ten minutes. Okay. So cool. I don't want to end without commenting somewhat on Julian. Okay. Um, right. So throughout the novel, we recognize Julian's unstable situation given his job loss, which has created feelings of frustration. But Santos Favres points out that Julian understands that ultimately for him, the lack of work um, is, is in part a choice. He reflects on the fact that unlike Tadeo, he could easily call in a favor um, to his family or one of their connections and get a job. But he, he actually doesn't do that. In distancing himself from his family, Julian does feel lonely. And that shared loneliness is what initially draws him to Tadeo. In addition, in meeting Tadeo and in getting to know him, this is how Julian comes face to face with the everyday effects of poverty, um, the, real the, the real possibly long-term consequences on the society are thus made glaringly obvious to him. Through that initial contact, Santos Ferris reduces Julian to the object of an ironic gaze. Initially, when Tadeo learns that he, uh, Julian, is a writer, he accuses him of being queer, as are most writers, in his opinion. On the one hand, Tadeo is bound to perform a heavy-handed heterosexual masculinity because culturally this performance of identity is expected of real men. But on the other hand, Tadeo also holds the notion that writers never seem to do anything. This thought resonate, resonates with the reader and we understand Tadeo's absurd positioning, not because we necessarily believe it, but because in the extremity of the idea, we see the display of machismo, which is so rampant and expected in Caribbean societies. This comment can be read as Santos Febres' critique of an exaggerated masculinity so prevalent in Puerto Rican society. However, the inherent mistrust of writers is also something that Julian understands, because this is one of the reasons why he had escaped from his family in the first place, and why he now lives isolated from them. Nevertheless, he learns a lot from Tadeo, and even later attributes his renewed interest in writing to Tadeo. I began this chapter with a quotation from Santos Febres, in which she refers to Puerto Rico as una isla ilegal, an illegal island. On the surface, this seems like such a condemnation of Puerto Rico, and by extension, all of these islands of the Caribbean. Uh, all of these islands of the Caribbean Sea, forged from successive wars, European domination, destruction, and massacres. At the same time, there can be no doubt that it is a justified condemnation in 21st century Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, where urbanization, 
social stratification, and a rampant drug culture are the new normal, and where criminality continues to be a major problem. We can argue that the island is illegal, not merely because it was created out of criminal behaviors and illegal trade, but that the careful construction and protection of criminal and illegal activities ensure that the islands continue to survive by illegality, the drug trade, social stratification, which ensures cyclical poverty, and the trafficking of migrants who are a cheap labor source. At the end, if Rain Soreno, the union leader, is dead, Chino has disappeared, presumed dead. Tadeo reflects from his prison cell while awaiting uh, deportation. That is to say, uh, Tadeo recognizes that being locked up abroad is the final reconciliation of his present with his past. Perhaps even the only possible income uh, outcome, the only possible outcome to the complex code of silence surrounding the illegal drug trade, which will continue unabated. Ironically, it is only Julian who comes to understand that his lot in life is perhaps not all that bad. He points out, it's difficult to live in a labyrinth on water that promises one exit through Europe, another through Africa, another through New York, and yet another through Asia. And perhaps even more difficult when you are no longer carrying the lantern of nostalgia. Julian returns to La Noticia newspaper and continues to write. In many ways, he is saved by his writing and hopes that it may play the same didactic role among his eventual readers. Muchas gracias.